Okay. Everybody ready? I'm ready. All right. So, my name is Scott Moulton. You guys have seen me around and you've heard me a thousand times. Shut up! Hi, Scott. So, I do forensics for a living. I do data recovery for a living. And I also wrote a book in 2007-2008, a 1200 page book, which I now teach a class on, on how to do data recovery, physical side. Blah, blah, blah. You can find me on myhardrivedive.com or forensicstrategy.com. Uh, so, enough about me. Uh, so, this talk is really about file systems, kind of. Um, I'm involving stuff that has to do with cameras. This is the first time I've given this talk. And uh, this really kind of came around because I recently took a trip to Australia. And while I was in Australia, there's a, a guy named Zorin there who is like the king of file systems. He's a and so I give him a lot of props for at least even turning me on to look at this stuff and, and try to try to deal with this. But uh, he, he far exceeds the capabilities of most people I've even met in America that do file systems, especially since that's kind of my bread and butter dealing with forensics. And so uh, I went there to go teach a class, and he asked me, well, what are you doing about XFAT? How many people know what XFAT is? Yes. How many people, I'll take a little test here, GPT. Who knows what GPT is? Okay, good. I'll go ahead and make this too technical then. Uh, MBR. Oh, yeah. All right, good. All right, so MBR leads to GPT, and then we'll lead into XFAT. So that's how that's going to go. FAT 32. XFAT is FAT 64. That's really what it is, with a new name, so that Microsoft didn't have to try to defend it, I guess, for putting a number behind it, and you can't patent a number or whatever. All right, so, uh, so while I was there, he asked me about XFAT. Now, XFAT. Uh, came out in Vista Service Pack 1, at least as far as a release to the public in our current computers. And so some of you may have noticed when you would put in like a, uh, at least since Vista, which, you know, all six people that have Vista are... Shut up. Uh, Shut up. Uh, Shut up. One of them's in the room. Uh, <laughs> dang. Ooh. And then Windows 7 and so on and so on have, have the opportunity to format, say, a solid state disk, a, a thumb drive or something, or even a physical disk as XFAT, so you would have seen this in the list. Uh, and you know, just to kind of go down this path, I was ignoring XFAT. I think it's a loser. Uh, basically, since it came out in Vista, not one single time have I seen it in a single case ever. In front of, I've done three, four hundred cases at least since the release of, of uh, XFAT in Vista. Uh, it came out prior to Vista, it came out actually for Windows phones. It, it was released in Windows CE version 6 in 2006 and was added to Windows phones to help the phones survive because flash drives, if you've seen any of my other talks or any of the previous stuff I've done, flash drives have this inherent uh, ability to kill themselves. They eat their own cells and over time will destroy themselves and become unusable. So the whole point is to diminish the ability of them to make changes to the file system that the file system wants to make changes to so that these devices live longer. Anyway, getting on a whole side path here. But, so while I was there, he said, well, what are you doing about XFAT? And I'm like, nothing, because nobody's using it. It's a loser. And he goes, well, what about all these embedded devices? And I'm like, what embedded devices? And he goes, well, what about cameras? And so he pointed me at some of the stuff that's going on with cameras. And here in this country, we, I guess we're getting a much limit, more limited subset of what's actually happening in some other countries where they allow imports and exports a little bit more uh, frequently than we get here. So when I get back here, I start checking on cameras and start checking on certain things. Uh, how many people have heard of an SDXC card? Yes. So it's starting to come out. People are starting to be able to buy them. But I went to, I mean, Atlanta's not a small place. I went to six or seven stores, including Fry's. I could not buy them here. I had to order them on the internet in order to do anything with them. However, the cameras that were on the shelf uh, most of the current cameras that are on the shelf at Best Buy support SDXC cards. <coughs> so this is where this whole thing came from. So I'm going to explain this and what's actually happening here. And this is one of these, these webs of things that just never seems to end. So understand that as much as what I'm showing you here, there's newer and more recent stuff. There's a lot of content. And every time you, you unwrap one little level of what's happening with a camera or a card or a license or an operating system, there's another level. And it just keeps on going. So this talk could go on for hours. But I'm going to limit it, obviously, to my 50 minutes or less. So this, uh, the whole idea here is that your camera 
is worth three hundred thousand dollars to Microsoft. So we're going to talk about what that is. And so this is actually uh, from Microsoft's website. This is their SharePoint uh, website logo or whatever it is. And so it says Microsoft, your potential is our passion. And from looking at the licensing aspect of what's happening with these cameras, I would suggest a change. I think that it should look like this. Your passion is our potential. And so when you start seeing how much money Microsoft is starting to make from this process, they are amazingly smart with this particular thing, but it, you know, it ultimately is going to hurt everybody else from the standpoint of what you're spending. So that was not me. That was Elsa. <laughs> So, so your camera's worth 300000 This is a licensing fee. Basically what this, what this has to do is how Microsoft is starting to license all their content. So the points that I'm trying to make in this talk are I want to introduce you to cameras and what the changes are that are happening in cameras because this is a revolution that's changing cameras right now, at least as far as what's going to happen here in the future. Up until this point, we've been living with FAT32. All of our cameras have been doing FAT32. And so this is about to change. Uh, new SDXC cards. Most people are very familiar with SDHC cards, which is what you've been buying uh, from 32 gigs to 4 gigs for all of your cameras, as well as like CF and a couple other things, but I primarily want to talk about SD cards. Uh, and to educate you on this new file system, because this impacts everything, not just your camera, it impacts your operating systems, your Macs, Windows, Linux, uh, iPads, uh, tablets, Android phones, everything. Pretty much everything I can list is going to affect uh, all the way down. So we're going to talk about some of the differences and some of the things. So let's get started on these things. First thing is, there is an association. It's called the SD Card Association. The, uh, the SD Association makes all the choices about what's going to happen to your card and what the new technologies are. So believe it or not, there actually is somebody who makes that choice for you and that you get very little say in what is actually happening. You just get to choose a device. And so when SD cards came out, it took a little while, but eventually everybody switched to them. You know, Sony had their own thing, and they were not using SD cards for a while. Now Sony uses SD cards. Almost every other vendor has moved on at this point, and now is using SD cards or still sticking with CF, uh, Compact Flash. Uh, there's a reason Compact Flash still exists, has to do with speed and performance. Pretty much everybody else has kind of kneeled down at this point, and they're using SD cards or one variation of them of some kind. And so this is what just happened. Uh, well, it happened in 2009. At the end of 2009, the SD Card Association has decided and they adopted XFAT file system for its latest capacity of high-speed SDXC cards. So every one of these in the series, the SD Card Association announced that now XFAT is the standard. So XFAT is a particular item that is done by Microsoft. So Microsoft has licensed it out and they convinced the SD Association to use their file system as their default. So when you now buy an SDXC card, it comes pre-formatted with XFAT on it. And so what this really means is, every time you turn around, something has to license it. So you'll see this announcement that actually happened at the end of 2009, and then it takes a while for it to get into cameras and make its way out. But Microsoft announced that they're licensing XFAT. You can see that it's everything from digital photo frame software, blah, blah, blah. And you can see the number right here, $300,000. That's what they initially are licensing. Now they break this down in their licensing content according to subcategories. So not everything is $300,000, some things are more, <laughs> obviously. So embedded devices may be $300,000, but when you're looking at operating systems, such as the Macintosh operating system, the, uh, and using HFS and things like that, you will now also have to use XFAT as well. So Apple would pay a licensing fee, and it would be a volume licensing fee because they have to base it based on the number of sales that they actually have on their operating system. So when they're selling billions, they're going to be paying Microsoft a little bit more. So, yeah. Uh, does Linux have XFAT support? <laughs> <laughs> We're in, I've got it. So anyway, they, again, they break this down according to the types of devices and things like that. They pretty much started, uh, they did obviously start with phones. But of course, nobody is using, I mean, Windows phones exist, but let's face it, they didn't really win the market out there after 2006. Uh, so, <clears throat> so this is an article that was written, and it was uh, some of the focus, and we'll talk about Android here more in a few minutes, but, uh, you know, this title's a little bit misleading. Android gains an SDXC flash driver that's safe from Microsoft patent threats. 
Now, it's important to also note that SDXC or XFAT itself has extensive patents and it has been changed in ways that FAT32 could not have been, have been done. FAT32 has kind of made their way through the market. There's a lot of people who are using FAT32 who weren't paying licensing fees. And so there has been lawsuits and things like that where Microsoft has gone back and tried to recoup content that has been lost by them for other people using their FAT32 file system because they created it. And so you'll see that down here at the bottom. SDXC cards include at the heart XFAT. And this is a big win for Microsoft because everybody who uses SDXC cards and builds that technology in has to pay Microsoft royalties. And then they're, they're mentioning the TomTom Tom case and so on and so on. Uh, we'll talk about this again in a minute. But the way that Android escaped this by the title of this, where the flash driver is safe from patent threats, is by paying for it. <laughs> I'm not kidding. We'll get there. So, so who pays for this licensing fee? And, you know, I don't know if you noticed, but there's a, a camera in the corner. Over there. Oh! <laughs> oh. <laughs> Surprise! Right, there's a camera there. So, so, so ultimately, with regards to the camera, everybody's paying. I've gone back and looked, and I'm pretty sure every single camera manufacturer at this point has paid a licensing fee or some subset of licensing fees that are associated with them. Apparently, and this is where it starts to get a little bit fuzzier, when you're starting to talk about cameras, I'm not positive yet because a lot of these things are not disclosed. When Microsoft makes these patent deals and, pay, and they pay for the license, they are not disclosing how much everybody's paid and what has actually happened, even though they have that open source saying that they're doing $300,000 per fee. They haven't said, is it per camera? Or is it per a brand of camera? Or is there a dividing line there, like they said that there was with uh, computers versus network devices, or so on and so on. But you can start to see what the difference is in some of them that have paid and haven't. Like for instance, right now the PlayStation 3 doesn't support XFAT. So you can't take your card from an SDXC camera that you took a picture on and put it in a Sony PlayStation and see anything with it. It doesn't support it, and currently doesn't support the file system. So it's not just the card, it's the file system as well. So we'll talk a little bit more about this. <clears throat> so if these manufacturers are then paying a licensing fee, who gets to pay for it? We do. You do, right? Isn't that great? Everybody knows at this point, and this increases the price of your camera, increases the price of your professional cameras, and the whole list of things that keeps going from there. So you get to pay for it. So how did this happen? What, what actually happened that allowed the SD Association to say, hey, look, we're going to use XFAT? And what would have convinced them or gone down this path? And so at this point, it's kind of it's starting maybe to come clear that at this point, Microsoft's going to get money from every camera manufacturer that there is out there, and then eventually everything, probably you know, in the iPhone, probably, or, or whoever's going to have an SDXC card is going to be able to read it or do anything with it, and probably the iPad at some point. Uh, so how did this happen? So the way this story really happens is all the way back to Windows 2000. Windows 2000 is one of the first operating systems that Microsoft released that even though it has FAT32 support in it, it stopped allowing you to format anything over 32 gigs. Do you guys remember this? Okay. All of a sudden, you could not, after, because Windows 98, Windows ME, all these other ones would allow you to format up to 2 terabytes. However, at Windows 2000, they removed this ability, saying that FAT32 is inefficient at anything larger than 32 gigs. So therefore, we're going to remove this ability for you to format anything except NTFS or FAT32 that's up to 32 gigs, right? Everybody good so far. And then follow suit with everything else. So it's all the servers, uh, Windows 2K, XP, Vista, Windows 7, blah, blah, blah. Everybody good so far? So the funny thing is, is that as you guys are probably aware, a Mac can format a 2 terabyte FAT32. It's actually easier than struggling with Windows to try to format something at FAT32 if it's 2 terabyte or some drive that you want to move, or something that didn't exist in Windows 2000, like for instance, your thumb drives, right? Your thumb drives in Windows 2000, we didn't have 32 gigs or bigger. Now you can go down the street and you can buy a 128 gig thumb drive or 256, and you can't format them in Windows because you can't go higher than 32 gigs, right? You have to use some special tool or download something or do something else. You can't do it natively in the files in the operating system. Yes, sir. Did you do that in Windows 3? Yes. Yeah, as a man saying, I even put that in here, like Windows can actually read anything that's FAT32 
up to two terabytes. So the, the default for this entire process was up to two terabytes. Now, there's this magic number, two terabytes. You guys have probably heard this a number of times, at least with discussion of computers and where we stand with regards to biases and things like that. What's the reason that we can't go past two terabytes? The fact 32-bit. Yeah, it's 32-bit, which limits us to two terabytes in the format. But what is the thing that binds us to that? Our MBR, the master boot record, right? For 30 years now, we've had a master boot record that has really essentially not changed. The first sector on our hard drives is our master boot record. And I'll show something here in a shortly so you can at least see what it looks like. But, uh, but the master boot record, because it's 32 bit, it can only count up to 4 billion blah, blah, blah. And you divide by 2 because you have 512K sectors. And it takes 2 to make 1K. So therefore, you're at 2 terabytes. So we are limited by this. What's the fix for getting past this MBR problem? GPT. So the GUID partition table. And that's like an enigma wrapped in an enigma because uh, GUID is uh, a guaranteed unique identifier. So GUID partition table is a new, uh, or since 2005, 2006, a new way of doing partition layout to get rid of what we've used for 30 years for our NVR. What's our problem trying to use? A GUID partition table. Anybody know? What do you have to have? License. What? License. No, well, you do have to have a license. That is true. So there's these things are, you know, battling with licenses. But what what's the one problem? Why why can't I just go get a computer that I used in 2008 and go format something and make a GUID partition table? 64 bit. Yes, you do have to have 64 bit. You have to have Windows 64 bit because Windows XP doesn't support it. So Windows XP does not support the GUID partition table. And you also have to have right the bias. The bias is our problem. The bias talks to the first sector, which is our MBR, and then that is what we actually use to introduce our drive to our computer, so we have to go through uh, EFI. So EFI is Extensible Firmware Interface. All of these things are coming to a head right now. Like, this is this is the end of the BIOS. This is the end of what we know. And some of the laptops that you guys have here have already switched from a BIOS to EFI. You just don't know it. So until you boot your machine and look at it, you'll see. And you can't install Windows XP as a native operating system on those devices without doing some tricks. Uh, Max, in 2006, when Mac switched to an Intel platform, they remember for like four months, a Mac did not boot Windows. And people were always like, hey, it's an Intel pl platform now. Why can't we boot Windows? And they were doing some hacks. Well, Boot Camp basically takes the MBR and takes everything from the good partition table and pastes it into the MBR so that then the MBR can be pointed to so that you can then boot your Linux disk or you can boot Windows. But without the MBR, it couldn't have worked. And it didn't use an MBR because it uses an EFI, and it did not need this. So it was uh, so basically you're formatting in a GPT partition table. I know I'm getting really deep here, but everybody with me so far? Yeah. Yep. So this is a continual story that never ends until we kill our bias. Windows XP is gonna is the thing that's holding everybody back, at least from that standpoint, because they're not going to develop any drivers to deal with GPT. However, they did make a driver to deal with XFAT. So Windows XP does support XFAT if you install a certain service patch. So they they have gone back and added things that they considered necessary so that they could license them. Amazingly enough, right? Because what would happen if you had Windows XP and you go and you plug your camera that you paid you know, now, you know, Panasonic paid $300,000 to Microsoft for and you plug it into your machine and you can't even see the card, you're going to get a lot of pissed off customers. Kind of like you do when you buy a three terabyte hard drive. Yeah. Right? You have one terabyte that's unusable. So, because we cannot address it if you are using an MBR. Master boot record can only address up to two terabytes. And it's not like you can partition it and say, well, I'm just going to leave this one terabyte and have one terabyte and two terabyte. You can't talk to it because it's too far past the extension for you to be able to address it in 32 bits. So it's got to be in 64 bit. Everybody good? Easy. Nope. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you can pull off some sort of trick, but your problem is addressing the actual clusters. So they do that with external hard drives by doing some tricks, like they did with the old, you know. Disk management tool that was written by one. You remember that crap, right? <laughs> layers of its bug yeah, patch. Off. Later on, it screws up your system. It, it's can't. the same reason the original three terabyte hard drives came with a SATA 
card that you just had to install to actually use. Right, and that patched the bias, basically allowing it to go through. And you could use it as an external, but you couldn't use it as a boot drive unless you were using 64-bit with the GPT. Anyway, moving on from there. So you can read in Windows well, anything larger than 32 gigs. You just can't format it. So when you buy a card, what was the limit of the cards up till now? 32. 32 gigs. For like five, six years, we had like 32 gig cards. So this is our problem, right? We've had we've had these SD cards that have been around for a long time, and these are the standard one. These are the you know secure digital high capacity cards. And so these cards have been in cameras, and we've been using these since you know from four gigs to 32 gigs. This is actually the path that they chose in late 2009, and then started publishing. And most people don't even know it's out there because you can't buy these cards in America quite yet. So when you're looking at it, you'll see up to two gigs, you had FAT12, FAT16, then you had SDHC, and you had from four gigs up to 32 gigs, and it stopped there. And there, it's actually out of spec. There actually are SDHC cards that are greater than 32 gigs, but you can't guarantee that your camera will support it because if it's over a certain number of blocks, the camera will automatically format it as 32 gigs. It will not see it or talk to it or allow it to communicate. And so when you're beyond 32 gigs, you're out of spec, and so the SDHC standard that the SD Association put out as version 2 <coughs> will only support up to 32 gigs. So then you're looking at some buggy things, whether or not it'll work or not. Even though they do sell a couple of cards, they're not really usable, at least under this, under this format. And if it's greater than 65,534 blocks, which would be the equivalent to the 32 gigs, it will automatically, if the camera supports SDXC, automatically format that as XF. So your card formatted by the camera doesn't ask you. There's no choice in the camera. And it will just automatically format it as XF. So this is what we're talking about here, is from this 2 terabytes, to, or from 32 gigs to 2 terabytes. So supposedly these cards are going to get up to 2 terabytes in theory. I don't know when that will happen. It's a slow progression at this moment. I think the highest I've seen is 256 so far. But <clears throat> So what are our advantages if we're switching to XFAT? Now, I do want you to understand XFAT is not just for these cards. You can use XFAT on hard drives, on other devices, anything that will you know, act like a hard drive, a solid state drive, things like that. You can format them as XFAT, but uh, it may, may require some changes. There are some things here with regard to these cards that are different than your standard XFAT. So that's what I'm going to talk about too. So this is what Microsoft put out on their page when they said, hey, this is great. The SE Association decided to allow us to be you know, the, the, the next standard in their card. And so this is what Microsoft says is the advantages for using this. So I'm going to attack each one of these one by one. And we're going to discuss this and see what's actually happening and if it's a win or a lose for us. So uh, supposedly it reduces file system format. Uh, it enables the file system to handle any capacity larger than 32 gigs. Well, as you already know, that's already a lie. Handles more than 1,000 files in a single directory. That would be nice. Speeds up your storage allocation process. Removes the previous file size limit of 4 gigs. Everybody knows FAT32 has a 4 gig limit, right? Anybody who tried to copy a DVD knows that you have to reformat your external hard drive if you want to copy that stuff on there and either use HFS or NTFS or uh, EXT, whatever, whatever file system of choice that you want to use. Right? Everybody good? No problems there? And what was it in FAT16? Anybody know what the file size limit was in FAT16? Two. Two. Two gigs, right? So a lot of you will notice that sometimes when you're copying and you're using a thing that chunks up files into smaller files as it's making a big file, it chunks them into two gig sections, right? Because FAT16 was the most compatible file system and it wasn't protected under FAT32's patent crap that was out there. So there's some things that happen there. Uh, support for interoperability with future operating systems, and it has an extensible format for including OEM-defined parameters. So your OEM can now decide specific things in the operating system that they want to change. Flags they want to set, delimiters they want to set, uh, things about like, oh, this camera has its own model number and it can be written in there. There's things with timestamps that you can actually track, not only the local timestamp, but you can track UTC, so you can actually see what the global time would have been. So there's a lot of things like that that are in there. So let's talk about these things. So, XFAT 
it's uh, the whole point of the smaller footprint is we give up a lot of space in NTFS. In NTFS, which has been our most our, our biggest standard for 90% of our file system stuff out there, in NTFS, we do give up quite a bit of space. On this two terabyte drive on the left, I don't know if you guys can see this number very well, but on this two terabyte drive, just formatting it, not writing any files or doing anything, it used up 147 megs just to be able to track the files that you may have in the future to start with. Blank. Okay, everybody in? Same drive formatted with XFAT. It used 1.5 megs. So it has a much smaller overhead, and you can then use that space more efficiently. So it is much smaller, uh, and it really is in real life when you're using it. Yeah? I thought, I thought one of the advantages of NTFS was that it's resilient for like power downs and things like that, and yes. correcting errors. Is that true also of XFAT? Well, so what he's asking about is the transaction oriented file system. Uh, Microsoft, what you all know is journaling, Microsoft calls transaction oriented. It's the exact same thing, but they just don't like to be like everybody else and use the same word, so they call it transaction oriented. XFAT has the capability of doing it, it's not turned on. Awesome. It currently hasn't been implemented in this function at all. There's a lot of things it can do. It can do a lot of things that NTFS can do, like track security. It can do things that are, are optimized for uh, anything having to do with flash drives, so it also turns off some things that actually do fragmentation and defragmentation so that the flash drive will live longer. It's really a, a, it's really a focused uh, item. It's not meant to be your boot drive. It's meant to be uh, an embedded device or a device or a file system for a hard drive that would be an external unit. NTFS is still the default or HFS if you're using Max. So it's not meant to replace those in the boot system. Yes, sir. Does the, uh, the advantage maintain as you fill it with files as far as you know, so do you pay at the beginning with NTFS and pay later with yes. So, uh, so as it grows, it does take up more space to keep track of the files in the file system. So that is true. Uh, NTFS, however, tries to reserve 12.5% of its initial disk in Windows XP and tries to reserve 200 meg in Windows uh, 7. And it will try to maintain that as a reserve space because it's close to the outside edge of the disk and it's optimized for speed. So as times change, the outside edge of the disk is the fastest location because there's more sectors that don't have to change. So physically, to answer your question, you do sacrifice uh, some as it grows and you add files. You will have, but that's 1.5 megs is a really small amount of overhead for your file system under any file system out there right now. Uh, but also, uh, NTFS will shrink that. If, for instance, if you, on NTFS, if it reserves 12.5% and you're using big files, as it, as it starts to encroach on that 12.5%, it doesn't keep it maintained, it will start to shrink it. Uh, NTFS also stores small files, anything that's below 931 bytes will be stored inside the MFT entries themselves to reserve space because when you have a cluster size, you lose a certain amount of space, which was why FAT32 becomes inefficient. FAT32 will format to 32K clusters, and so if you have a 1K file, it'll use 32K. But on a camera, you're using a chunk of contiguous space. It's not 1K. So you would only have some overlap at the tail of one file and the beginning of the next file. So it's not really more efficient from a camera's perspective. Everybody good? That's a lot of information in my breath right now. Yeah. Uh, do you know what the comparable size is for XFAT with journaling turned on? You can't turn it on currently because it's not implemented. So they did not implement it in the code at all. It has the ability to be implemented, and supposedly they're giving the option to vendors who want to do embedded devices. And uh, currently I have not seen a single piece of device or code out there that does have the transaction implemented yet. yet. So it's one of those incomplete standards. And for just for you know the notation sake, the security for the ACL for uh, for any of your access control lists and any of the security, even if they ever implement this into the future, this the Service Pack One did not have any of this implemented in it. So all you have to do is take your device back to Service Pack One in Vista. So we can go over to Amy's house and use her computer, and we can uh, we can then plug something in that now has security on it and probably bypass the security just by using the unimplemented version. Yeah, Yay, Vista. Woo! So anyway. <laughs> yeah, and and, and just, a, just a note too, XP was never going to be updated again. Remember, they sunsetted XP and they said they were never going to update it again. And then they came out with a service patch 
that allows you to do uh, ex uh, or xfat in it, and it's just meaning it's this licensing thing. So but we're going to talk about this in a minute because XP doesn't support what GPT. So this is a problem, right? So we're going to talk about this two terabyte limit and stuff in a minute. But anyway, so you can see this is much smaller here on the right. Now, so I formatted an XD, uh, SDXC card. I got my hands on some, and I've been testing multiple ones. Uh, I actually, I didn't want to go buy like a thousand cameras. I have a couple of cameras, but I didn't just buy a thousand cameras to go test them all. So I made friends at some of these uh, camera shops that let me come in, and they'll actually let me sit there like with a hex editor and go over stuff in my computer, and I'm like copying things onto the card, taking pictures, formatting them, and testing like 25 cameras or something at this point. And I've got like little snippets of the first 16 megs of every card that I copied because that's where all the changes are. And so we'll talk about this, but when I plug the SDXE card into the machine, I see this. So this was formatted by the camera. This is now licensed by the camera and given to them by Microsoft. And I formatted it in the camera and I plug it into Windows and I see this. And I'm like, what the? This doesn't make sense. I just lost 16 megs when it's only supposed to be, I mean, for 64 megs, if I had formatted 64 gigs, it should be something like, you know, 300K or something taken up. It shouldn't be, because the other one was 1.5 megs for a 2 terabyte. It should be small. So why did I lose 16 megs? So I start looking at this, I'm going, because nobody else is really looking at this yet. As far as I know, I'm the only person who's looked at this, they've all reported that XFAT works the same on the cameras that it does on the hard drive. And that's not true. And so, the first thing is that I want to note is that, let's just say we did sacrifice the 16 megs. If I had formatted this under NTFS and just said, well, fine, I want my camera to use NTFS, and I formatted it, it still would only be 8 megs. The, the actual table would only be 8 megs. Now, we're still going to lose space because in the E drive where it's formatted, I'm also going to lose another 300K or so of overhead. So, 16 megs. So, now I say, well, I need to see this in a hex editor. I'm a forensics guy. I want to know what the hell is up, right? So, I'll plug this in. All right, now, well, first, this is an actual, this is what I normally look at. This is a MBR. This is the master boot record from a standard hard drive. This is what you would normally see on any of the formatted hard drives that you use out there in the field right now. This is what I see every day. And so this is what a standard record looks like. All I see is missing operating system. Okay, well, you don't have to worry about that. The whole point is, I got, <laughs> you have a chunk up here that's all going to be handled by your, your bias and your bootloader, and that's all going to take care of everything. And then you see the section down here where, the, where in hex it starts over again. I don't know. It's a little bit small for you guys. You see this piece right over here? So where it starts right over here in these two lines right here, that's your partition tables. Those are your partition tables that tell you I formatted this, these are the bounds, this is where I begin, this is where I end, and there is a number over here that actually will tell you if you were an OS or something like, so 07 means that it's a, a, this is supposedly usable by Windows. So this is actually what it would normally look like when you format a drive. So this is what I'm used to seeing every day. But then, I plug this card in, and I'm looking at this card, and so this is what I have. And I'm looking at this and I go, what the? This is all blank. And then you get down here, and then I've got this row that again starts to look like this. And look, I've got a 07. So it's format window. So the first thing I know is that it is, this is the partition information. The rest of the sector is, is blank. But so it wasn't formatted by Windows. It wasn't formatted like a standard MBR. So when the camera formatted it, all it did was stamp out what it's going to use as a pointer for the partition table. And then everything you'll always see down here, the end of a partition signature for Windows to be able to mount, it always has to be able to see 5588A as the last two bytes of the first sector. Otherwise, it will not mount the drive and let you see it. It'll, you know when you plug in a brand new drive and you never formatted it? If you actually look at it inside the Windows Disk Management, usually when you go into Disk Management, if it sees a drive that hasn't been formatted, it will pop up a box and says, do you want to format this? Blah, and it has a box, right? If you're already in disk management, when you plug it in, it'll show it to you, and you'll get a red circle over on the left-hand side of the drive. You know what I'm talking about? Like, right here, there would be a red circle. And it would, if you right-click on it, it'll say something like import foreign disks or whatever. So when you see that, that means the MBR has not been fully written. It doesn't know the MBR. And so when 55AA is at the bottom of that signature, it will show that it's there. It'll show the partition table and show that it's there. 
Everybody good? Yes. So when I'm looking at it and I look at that, I go, woo, I got a partition, and then I got 55AA. And I'm like, but where have I seen something like this before? Has anybody used GPT yet? Anybody looked at it in the hex editor? Yeah? So I reformat a disk using a Mac, and I format it as GPT and then EXT. So, I mean, uh, uh, XF. And so, if you look, this is what a hard drive looks like when I format it. And I actually have this partition table. Now it's different. The partition table is different. But then I also have this part right here where it says EF, EF, EFI, the extensible firmware interface. This is where code can actually be written for the EFI for the component for that drive. And so now I'm starting to think, well, this 16 megs that is left over, maybe the 16 megs, this blank area, is to protect that in case it was formatted in GPT. And, of course, that turns out to be completely incorrect because it, it, it might be trying to preserve something, but if you plug it back into the camera, the camera will report memory card error. If you plug it back into a window system after you've done the MBR correct so that the camera can read it, because I even tried pasting the correct partition in, uh, actually changing it in hex and pasting the partition table in, when you do that, uh, the camera will read it correctly, but then Windows or Mac or whatever that you plug it into will say, this GPT drive is improperly formatted, I cannot do anything with Strive, and it'll put it in read-only mode. It will allow you to copy data off, but it won't let you have access to the disk and make changes or do any of the normal stuff. So it's kind of like a half-assed, pasted-on version of an MBR. And so I, start, I get to thinking about this, so the cameras support a standard MBR. And when you put a fat card in, and they can format them as fat, they format this MBR and they deal with the MBR. When you plug in an SDXC card, it formats it as a fat, uh, the same way, it does an MBR, and the MBR pointer is still there, but then it's X fat after that, and just gets the 16, me 16 megs, which that's the only thing you can come up with, is what's left there for EFI, just in case they want to protect it, but you can't use it or do anything with it, and they're both improper. Either version is improper, it doesn't work correctly. So I can see it just fine, and I can use it. But you'll see, too, there's a difference in the partition table. And uh, in XFAT, there's actually a definition that has to do with what needs to be here in the partition table to use XFAT. Well, apparently, Microsoft removed that stipulation for cameras and embedded devices haphazardly, just like half-assed removed it from the standard. I don't really know yet. Uh, I'm trying to figure that piece out. but. Uh, but then there actually is other content there, like you can actually see in that first 16 megs, I'm actually picking up content that says this was formatted in a Mac, and I'm actually picking up variations of the file system. But if I mess with it or do anything with it, it is no longer usable if I change the partition table. And then I did have some weird thing, this was just a weird thing to note, when I bought the cards and I bought them brand new, they came pre-formatted as XFAT. And so I made images of those two cards that I bought to compare them to see what the differences were, and SanDisk, for some reason, in the very last sector of the drive, had crap in it. I still don't know what the crap was there for at some point in time. They just wrote crap to the card, either to test it or do something. But that's still a mystery. Uh, the other cards didn't have them. So, so anyway, moving on from there. <coughs> that's the only part of hex that you guys have to suffer through. Uh, uh, so increasing capacity larger than 32 gigs. Well. I consider this to be false. We already were able to do this. Microsoft just removed our ability to do this. So we've already talked about the other stuff. But our problem would still be, if we had a 64 gig card, Windows, which owns 90% of the market, still would not be able to format this card. So I consider this to be a false statement. Greater than 1,000 files in a single directory. Well, it's nice that Microsoft listed this as an advantage, but FAT32 FAT on their website, they say, flat out, and I haven't tested up to that standard, I've tested 10,000 something files. So I at least know it goes greater than 1,000 in FAT32. But they say 65,534 files will fit in a single directory. <coughs> so another false statement, yeah, you need a magic number, right? And, yeah, wasn't the thousand for FAT16? There was initially the thousand limit for FAT16, but so if they're saying FAT32, yeah, they're locked. Yeah, right. They're just saying this is your super advantage for using FAT64. Well, it looks like they did a bad job of cutting yeah. FAT64. Well, it's marketing material too, right? So, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Propaganda. 
Yes, yeah, right. You're right. Like, I guess it's 300,000 now. Really so, want to try to open a file on a directory that has that many files in it. It is, it is, <laughs> it is unbearably slow, it but is. it is plausible you can do it. Yeah. Understand that when a camera is writing files, it's not necessarily trying to read from the same list at the same time. So it's it's appending content there, and it is still fairly rapid at doing that. Uh, but I would also say if you're a professional photographer and you put 10,000 files on one card, uh, you may your job may be in jeopardy here at some point, right? Because if you pay for professional any kind of professional work to be done, oops, one card's dead. And and we'll get to this part too. What actually happens to the cards and how they can corrupt? We'll talk about that. Uh, so. Now, the speed up the storage allocation, um, one of the biggest things that it does in XFAT is it uses a free bitmap sector. So you can actually do, like, it can actually search for the first free bitmap location and then go write the file in that location. And it is very rapid and very quick doing this part. So this part at least is true that it actually could fill a contiguous location much faster. Uh, you still have fragmentation and other problems as well, but uh, since they're contiguous and the files can be written contiguous, I, I will at least give them this point. Then, uh, removes the file size limit of 4 gigs. Now, on a camera, who perceives this to be a problem? Right? Okay, so on, a, on even your current highest end DSLR. Don't, don't, I'm sorry, don't, don't the, some of the high end video cameras do the, the video files and stuff? We're going to talk about that. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> See how I think just like you guys do one step ahead. That's the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it removes, so XFAT at least, if we were going to use that as an external hard drive, it might make sense that we can exceed our 4 gigs. But for a camera, even if you choose the highest in camera, the new Nikon D800, it's a 36 megapixel camera, you're still not looking at anything close to a 4 gig file. It's not even close, right? So where this might make sense is if you are recording video. Right? That makes sense, right? If you want to use your DSL camera to record a video, but I don't know if you guys understand this, but DSL camera, all cameras, except for camcorders, all cameras are limited to 30 minutes or less. You guys know this? Anybody yeah. tried it? Because yeah, the is uh, Nah, yeah, it's BS, isn't it? You know this by now, don't you? It's all about money. So the EU put a tax in 2007 on anything that can record video that was more than 30 minutes. And there's a 14% surplus for a surplus for import and export fee. So immediately anybody who's producing a higher end camera, this becomes a substantial amount of money. Uh, from an EU standpoint, if you're looking at the D800 Nikon, which is $800 or whatever, 14% of that, even in their money, is an extra three, four hundred dollars or something in taxes. It's higher. So, so this is why they're limited. Now, they've all made excuses. Oh, it will overheat the sensor or battery, whatever. And maybe at some point those are true. And there's a recent hack for uh, for one of the new night for one of the nighttime cameras that allows you to go past thirty minutes. But this is why they limit it. And some of them are even shorter than that. Some of them are a much shorter period than even that because they may be limited by the file size and they don't have a lot of code in them, so they are still chunk it at like two gigs and then quit. So some of them are going to be a couple of minutes, ten minutes, or something like that. So I decided to try to show you the quality of what you could get out of a DSLR uh, in this particular case. <laughs> stuck with if you start trying to record anything with your DSLR. So it's just the rules. Where's the camera? We'll talk later. What's that? We didn't know the camera too, so we can Yeah. So we can see the longer version, yes. So so anyway, the whole point is is that a camcorder might be where maybe these SDXC cards might be useful, but of course we really don't use SDXC cards in camcorders for the most part, right? Most of them are using them, but they'll take pictures with them. What they're recording on is still a hard drive. hard drive, right? Because we have two terabyte hard drives that we can put in a camera. Then we have small, you know, normal laptop looking hard drives that are up to two terabyte now that will actually fit in the camera and do just fine. And most of these cameras are formatted FAT32. 
So then you plug it back into your Windows machine or your Mac or whatever, and you can just copy those files off. But they are chunked into two gig components. So what happened years ago was that they said, well, look, we know we're using FAT32. We already have a solution. So they wrote a solution, and it's been implemented for years now. And so they probably already are paying a licensing fee. So they're doing ABA, ABC HD. So they're actually doing that format. And then you use software on your computer to read that file, weave it all back together, and do the whole thing. But it's not really a problem now, right? I mean, it might be nice to have one big giant file, but can you imagine what it might be like if you loaded that into your editor and you tried to deal with, you know, a two terabyte file? Um, XFAT allows, just for the record, up to 16 edibytes for a single file. So if your camera's doing this, but since we only have two terabyte partitions, we can't go higher than two terabyte, we could go up to 128 petabyte according to the actual uh, storage ability that it has, but we're limited by our NPR again. So I kind of don't consider this to be a winner because it's, there's already a solution out there that's already working. It's been implemented for a number of years. A lot of us are already used to the software that we're using for editing, and it's not going to make a difference to us if it's four gig. Although I really see that if we loaded a single file, then it may be a problem depending on memory and other content that you have. So I kind of consider that to be a little bit of a loser. <coughs> Interoperability, yeah. Where does this leave Linux? We're coming. We're coming. We're coming to it. It's my, it's my closer. <laughs> interoperability with future OSs. So, so when you're looking at interoperability, yes, it's true. You can interoperate with us as long as you pay us a lot of money. Big piles of cash. So no hidden fees, guaranteed. So, <laughs> so yeah. So Linux and then Android. So this is what we're looking at. So in 2009, uh, you, you guys may recognize this guy, because this guy is the guy who uh, did the, because Tapsra is the company that does the 3G driver for you to use NTFS for Linux operating systems, and they kind of took that code and made like a company out of it, and then figured out how to license it and do a good job with their new, better driver. You guys know about this, right? And they do pay, you do pay for that, that newer driver, the one that is more full featured and that they have done, right? So, so in this particular article that I showed at the beginning, uh, he says, they said, did Tuxra license XFAT for Microsoft? And he sat down and said, yes, in the summer of 2009, after one year of discussions, the agreement, yes, that we have done, the agreement covers access to the XFAT specification, Microsoft source code implementation to XFAT, and we're testing and verification tools, blah, blah, blah. So then the next question was, well, and how much did it cost? And of course, he answers, well, Microsoft offers flexible intellectual property. It sounds like a salesman for Microsoft at this point. Licensing for their XFAT system, please ask Microsoft. So now you know, if you're sending it to Linux, they're you know it's not like they're probably going to cut a good deal. Who knows? I mean, it's like, oh, Linux! Finally, we found a way to charge Linux, and uh, and it gets a little bit worse. So here's the, the next. Problem is how to, how to deal with who? There is a central place you cut a deal with Linux. Well, the now there will be, because look. Mike found a solution, or whatever his name is. SD, so listen, just read the uh, SDXE card and the SD card standard. While XFAT is the file system within the standard, Tuxra XFAT will in turn and is a licensed uh, file system implementation that enables devices and interfaces to connect with SDXE cards. Manufacturers that use Tuxra's XFAT system in mobile phones, digital cameras, and other devices require both an XFAT patent agreement from Microsoft and a license agreement from Tuxra. So what they're saying is they got a piece of code and they're ready to go, and you can, you can pay them and also pay Microsoft at the same time. So they have some sort of a agreement with regards to what their licensing fee is going to be and the code sharing and whatever else. And Microsoft's still going to get their other three hundred thousand dollars. However, I mean there may be multiple licenses now. So now Linux is actually stuck with two p two fees <laughs> instead of just one. Anyway. So, but ultimately, that's the whole point, because Microsoft doesn't write your code for you. They might give you the ability to use the patent and give you a specification, but they're not giving you the code. They're just giving you the ability to do it. So now they wrote a driver in 2000, and, and, this, is, and this is what they're using there. He's got a whole other discussion about Android and how he's licensing it for Android and what they're doing. And maybe this is a drop in the bucket for Google to go and get this license or do something else. I don't know, Astrid. Uh, but other than that, I, I have no idea how much they're charging for this whole picture all, all the way around. But as we're looking at this list of problems, at least with regards to embedding cameras and camcorders, uh, this is how I look at it. 
Did it reduce file system overhead? Well, not currently if you're using 16 megs just for that blank partition, at least at the size we're at. Once we get to 2 terabyte, yeah, maybe. At 2 terabyte, if we have a card, that works great. Uh, increased capacity over 32 gigs? Well, no. They went back and put an MVR, and they didn't need to do this, at least process. We could, you know, what if we used a GPT? We wouldn't need to be limited by the 2 terabyte. But they didn't do that because the cameras don't have the capacity to su support the code, and they'd have to license GPT as well. So, at least from this standpoint, we could have already formatted a card greater than 32 gigs, all the way up to 2 terabytes, if Microsoft would have just not had that, I mean, because they could always remove it in a patch too, and allow you to still format it, or buy another another uh, piece of software that does it. Handles more than 1,000, that's still a lie, because we could already do 65,000. Uh, it does speed up the allocation process, so I do at least give them points for that one. Uh, removes the previous 4 gig limit, not for a camera, it's unnecessary, so there's not really much to win there. Uh, support for interoperability, yes, for 300K, so I call that a bad one. And then the only other good one here is possibility is it provides an extensible interface so that OEMs can do specific things. And, and yes, maybe that's valuable, but that's why XIF exists too. They, they built XIF so we could put some of that metadata into the picture and then carry it with the picture. But there is some other flags they can do for like deleting, uh, like you can actually have your camera delete pictures even if it's, you know, it's kind of like trim is for solid state drives and things like that. But ultimately, when I'm looking at this, we got five misses and two hits, possibly. And one of them's not even going to be used currently. So speed for allocation for, for fat. But all of these camera people are still going to be paying for it and they're still going to do it. Was speed a significant problem? No. Uh, we already had classifications. Now, there is a new speed standard, but it can't be completely used yet. I'm going to talk about that problem in a second. One, I only got like two more slides, but I'll so point it out. $300,000 you get, what camera do you You get it to format your stick bigger. You get to make Microsoft. That's what she said. <laughs> yes. So for $300,000 you get to make Microsoft richer and get basically no extra features. Well, well and, and the other problem, which is older things, will not be able to read these cards at all. Which so, guarantees, which guarantees that Microsoft Exactly. So I agree with you, which is why I said this camera is worth $300,000 a month. Yeah, you did say that. Right. Now, I will point out a couple other things. That, so now, when you start looking at cameras, and I'll tell you in the testing that I did, it's a mixed bag out there. Um, so FAT32 has been around for a long time, and camera manufacturers have been using it for a long time. And it's not a lot for them to learn or to deal with. But when you're starting to talk about a new file system, you're talking about some crappy coders, or maybe even no coders anymore, because maybe the camera software has already been written for years and they didn't even need to hire anybody new. Now you've got a new file system you want to use on your camera. You've got to have somebody implement that. And who knows where they're getting this code from or doing whatever, but now it's got to format it, and it's got to use the content from this card to read and write. Lexar has this on their website, and I'm not kidding. This just shows you it's not really a memory stick problem, even though they're kind of making it seem like it is. Deleting images in the camera is a convenience, but at the same time can result in data corruption, especially with log fo large file formats like RAW and TIFF files. So move and save your images to the computer and then utilize editing software that came with your camera or third party, rather than erasing them using the camera. Now, I have done a lot of research on this, and there's all kinds of problems that I've seen with XFAT. When you delete pictures, or so you take three pictures, then you know, delete one, then take two pictures more, then delete one, because it starts doing fragmentation, starts looking for holes, it starts doing all kinds of other stuff. And so there's been a lot of people complaining on almost all brands about some problem where all of a sudden their cards get corrupt, and they plug them back in, and they've lost all their pictures. Now, I know that's probably not true. Now, just not, not from a standpoint of lost the files, but understand, they start, they go down, they go download a piece of data recovery software, and they start to point it at the card. What might be one of the first problems that data recovery software that they're downloading? It can't to, talk to the card. Can't talk to XFAT. Doesn't know what? crap about XFAT. Would you so, like to format? Yeah, right? Yeah, would you like to format? Yeah. So, uh, would you like to use this as a backup? Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, so this ends up being part of the problem is that we've got a mixed bag of code out there. We've got misunderstanding about what's actually happening. You have users who don't understand that there's a new file system. There's nothing that says there's a new file system. There's, you buy an SDXE card. It says SDXE. You put in your camera, you format it, you're done. And if you format the card, 
in Windows or you format the card in a Mac, you do not get the same layout you get on the camera. So we still have the same exact problem. We could have put our 64 gig card, if it was an SDHD card, into the camera and let the camera format it, which is what we now have to do anyway. If the camera doesn't format the card, what Windows formats is not compatible with the camera. But it's Windows. But you can read it, I guess, yeah. is the point. I've run into a whole slew of problems already, and it's a mixed bag back and forth. But understand that this is also now another future problem, which is uh, you're going to have cards that are going to be erased or deleted, or, or people aren't going to have access to their pictures because they don't know what they have. So if you sent a thank you note to Microsoft for all the extra business they're going to push away, <laughs> people corrupting cards, they want to cover pictures. Hey, hey, hey. Um, <laughs> I, I don't mind at all. Oh, look, it's an X-Pack card. Oh, I just win. Do you have an X-Pack recovery? Sure, I'll do X-Pack recovery every day, uh, any day of the week, yes. So there's not stuff out there. Oh, yeah, there is stuff out there. Okay. But you have to, like, but most photographers are using things like PhotoRec right, and things right. like that out there that might not support it. Or, you know, they may download Pandora or something that does NTFS or FAT. They might not know right. or have a clue. And that's part of the problem is that you don't know the layout. Raw is hard to recover from anyway because unless you have the header format for raw, not every data recovery piece of software supports the header format for raw. And so, like for instance, you buy a new Sony NEX7, it has a new layout that nobody else knows the headers for. And even up until just like a week ago or two weeks ago, uh, you couldn't even put them on uh, Mac. You couldn't even use an NEX7 and put it in your Mac because it had no support for file format. So, and consequently, it gets a little worse because some of our other problems are things like this. Um, the new format for the FDXE cards is a new thing that is for high speed, and it, that's, it has a new class. So what you've normally seen is class one through 10 for speeds. There's a new class, and it starts all over again. It's called UHS version one currently. And UHS version one is ultra high speed. That's what it stands for, version one. And it also requires card readers to be different. Uh, not all your current card readers. Now understand that in 2009, a lot of the vendors started changing out their card readers and supporting it in their firmware already. So some of them, like my Mac, supports it already, and I can talk to it. But there are certain readers, card readers, like if you've had a card reader for more than two years, it probably won't work when you plug in an SDXE card into it. So it has to have support for SDXE cards, and you have to know that that's what you're getting. And I have bought some that say they support SDXE cards and don't work. It's backwards. Backwards compatibility for the older stuff? Um, it, does, it does have backwards support you know, from the standpoint of using older cards in the newer cameras. Yes, that works fine. And the older, but if you have a newer card, you may need a new reader. And that means some of the built in ones, like your iMac from 2008, may not read these uh, without buying another $20 card thingy. Yes? Does this have some of the same word, uh, word leveling situations that you earlier referred to? No, uh, so that was the whole point of XFAT, and the XFAT is a, a, there's no fun, fundamental difference in the card itself, other than it being bigger. There is no physical difference yet. Version 2 will have a different pinout. Version 2 will require a completely different camera. Your current camera will not support version 2 at all. Of course, SDXC isn't supporting the current camera without getting the new one that supports SDXC, but all the cameras in the last year, year and a half, support it. You just don't know it. You have to look it up or whatever. But even most point and shoot support it at this point. Everybody's already paid for it. But it's crappy code. It's horrible code that has been in testing and just looked terrible. But uh, but at least from that standpoint, XFAT is to keep the cards from being destroyed gradually. But most of the time, when you're writing, you're writing a small amount of data. You're not writing as much as you would if it was a file system or an operating system, like you will when you put your SDXC card so you can get a 64 gig stick into your uh, Asus uh, uh, Transformer Prime, right? The new Android tablet. They, I'm guessing at some point we're they're going to. I don't think currently they do because again, it's licensing. Huh? Why would that's Android? Why would they want to do that? Because you can't import your camera pictures, right? Okay. So you take pictures of the camera. What do you use them for? I mean, primarily that's what you're using them for, right? I want to take my, but and just for the record, iPads don't currently support it at all. iPads do not support XFAT, and the current iPad little reader that you plug in does not support SDXC cards, so they can't read it at all. And they'd have to come out with a new camera kit, so you'd have to pay another 29 bucks, or whatever it is, for the camera kit, and then a new licensing fee because because since it's a tablet. 
they have to pay another three hundred thousand dollars to support it on their tablet. This is this is good. Now, what about some of some of the cameras have a USB port on them? You simply plug your USB. Uh, you can go buy, yes, you can go buy another USB card reader that supports SDXE for 14 bucks or whatever and plug that in through the USB port on your tablet as long as the tablet supports XFAT. Well, what I'm saying though is like I have a camera at home that has a USB port on the camera. Oh, right, yes. And I just attach it, I can actually read through the camera reader. I'll be honest with you, I have not tested using the USB port through the cameras, I can, that may be my next test, to see if it, because when a camcorder, it mounts, like for instance, if it's FAT32, and the camcorder recorded it, when it mounted, it mounted as FAT in your, in your system. I don't know if the camera tries to mount the file system in the OS yet. I'll have to try it. Yeah, I thought it might do a translation as well, or the custom software that they've written will suck it off the, through the camera's bias or whatever. But, uh, but at least currently, right now, that that would be the next thing. Uh, so and how did how did Microsoft convince the SD Association? Big lots of cash. So I could say that Microsoft. The question was, how did Microsoft convince the SD Association? Um, part of the issue might be TomTom, -tom, right? You guys know about the TomTom -tom lawsuit? So so TomTom -tom is a is basically a Linux. Uh, a GPS, right? So you drive around and you plug your card in, or even if it was an operating or a different operating system or whatever it was using, it was talking back 32 to the cards you would stick in. And so Microsoft sued them. And technically they lost, but then they threw in the, you know, before they actually got a judgment against them, they threw in the tower and said, okay, Microsoft, you win. And they got a judgment from Microsoft against them, whatever. And so my guess is, is that somewhere along the way, this played a role in all the things that have happened afterwards. My guess would be, hey, SD Card Association, I don't know if you have a license with us or not, whatever, but you know, we will indemnify you if you've chosen, because we are the next logical choice because you used FAT16 and FAT12, right. now you use FAT32 for your other cards, so we're the next logical choice. There is no other replacement, right? There really isn't. There's no other, I mean, what are you gonna do, HFS on your, on your camera? Yeah. I mean, there are cameras that do HFS, but is, is that going to be the logical choice? Or are you going to go out there and reinvent a new file system? Like, I mean, and we're not going to use Linux's file system on those because the camera's already formatting these tools. Now it's got to be licensed in some way. So, I, I don't so I know Sony, even though they paid the fee, has kind of thumbed their nose at it, and Sony has a new file format or a new format for so what's supposed to be the next CF replacement. But uh, CF is unique. One of the reasons CF survives, Compact Flash survives across all of these cameras no matter what, is that Compact Flash is the only spec that actually has an ATA spec, so it connects to a motherboard raw. Whereas all the other memory devices out there have to convert from USB. So when you plug it in, even if you've got a little card that says, oh, make my USB a IDE connector or a SATA connector, it's faking that. It's faking it through a USB interface. Whereas Compact Flash doesn't do that. Compact Flash actually connects directly to a motherboard and can be booted just like an ATA spec, ATA5, and it supports like hard drive. And that gives them higher speeds and higher read and write access. Uh, and so Compact Flash will probably survive for quite a bit longer, regardless of what they use, whether it's spending or not. Was it was a TSX search? Yeah, that's a new flash. Yeah. Was it Compact Flash on it? Or is it Are you talking about that QX? M, something like that. QXM, that's Sony's new version. I actually don't know what they use for a file system yet, but they've kind of thumbed their nose at Microsoft, so I'm not sure they're using Microsoft. But just know, and this gets worse, this is why I said it's an enigma and enigma and it keeps on going, is that as you look at this, everything's licensed. Because now, not only are you paying an XFAT license to Microsoft, you're paying an SD card license as well. So there's the SD association also reaps a benefit from the license. And then if Tuxer is doing it, then there's a license there. So by the time you're done with one device, you may end up with six or seven or ten other licenses. Uh, but the, but that looked like the biggest one to me right up front, Microsoft reaping this $300,000 blah, 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 one all the way around. And in my mind, at least as far as the camera itself, this would have solved the problem. Just don't limit it to 32 gigs. And we could use, it might be a little bit more inefficient to use an SDHC card at 64 gigs because the cluster size would be slightly bigger. But is it enough that's going to matter for a contiguous file? Probably not. You're going to lose a couple of K. Big deal. And so that would have solved it. And that is the end of my talk.
Guys, I'll tell you, one night we were on the phone, and someone sent me, sent me a picture of you when you were half naked playing with your nipples, and... Just kidding. I'm kidding. Not me. I did not share that photo at all. I didn't share that photo. Not that one. Well, with those fancy...